Ukraine is big news, and we want to cover the cyber aspects of it. A surveillance firm says Apple is phenomenal for law enforcement and a lot more news. Welcome to Surveillance Report 77, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news. This report will recap some of the most notable events from the last week. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And I'm Henry from TechLore. This week, our highlighted way to support us is cryptocurrency. We accept Bitcoin and Monero, TechLore does, and The New Oil accepts Bitcoin, Monero, Ethereum, and a couple others that we are trying out. So if you enjoy surveillance support and you get value out of it and you want to keep this going, be sure to donate and help keep us going. All right, so our highlight story this week, we are going to talk about the digital landscape in the current ongoing Russia and Ukraine war. We're going to go ahead and own our biases. Both of us are pro-Ukraine in this particular conflict. We're not trying to make surveillance support political. We never do. Uh, you guys do you. But we just want to let you know, if, if there's a slant, that's what it's going to be. It is important to remember as we discuss this story that the cyber aspect of this war going on is a very, very tiny fraction of what's going on. There is obviously a ton of physical conflict. There's, you know, bombings and airstrikes and, you know, there's the human cost. There's people being driven out of their homes and losing loved ones. So, you know, let's just keep that in perspective. Having said that, here are some of the privacy and cybersecurity specific stories that are coming out of Ukraine and what we can learn from it. So first up, the EU has offered cyber defense assistance to Ukraine in the form of trained teams who will help with training and response. Ukraine has also called for additional help from ethical hackers, and they have set up a Google Doc where people can submit, you know, what are their qualifications and how can they help. And Ukraine has said they will create both offensive and defensive teams. Ukraine has been suffering a lot of DDoS, DDoS attacks on both government and bank websites, as well as they've seen the spread of a data wiping malware that is disguised as ransomware, which currently has a very low detection rate. It's a brand new malware. Uh, Virus Total, which is a, a site where various uh, antivirus companies, you can like put in a file or a link and they'll tell you if it's malicious. Only 16 out of 70 of those uh, security engines recognize this malware as being malicious. That's how new it is. They're also being attacked with a phishing campaign that seems to be orig originating from the Belarusian government. So yeah, like we said, like the cyber aspect is just a very small part of this conflict. But I mean, clearly it's it's a part that is happening and is being invested in. Kind of big news. Uh, everyone loves this because they get a lot of headlines, <laughs> but um, Anonymous <laughs> has come back. It's a movement, not a, like a team or organization, but they have come back and they've announced that they're going to get involved and attack Russia. They allegedly blocked Pornhub in Russia. Um, but I, it's funny, Nathan put in the notes he wasn't able to replicate this with a VPN server, and I did the same thing right when I heard about it, <laughs> um, and neither of us were able to replicate it, so we don't know how true that is. Um, Anonymous is a little bit loosey-goosey on, on the things that they do. Um, they might be li whitelisting VPN servers. That's that's a possibility. I don't know. They might be. Or maybe the whole thing's made up. We just It's just hard to verify these also things. Also possible. Yeah. On another note, Ukraine has raised over $4 million in cryptocurrency donations. Ukrainians have turned to Signal as their primary encrypted messenger, which is awesome. Um, I think we all agree that private by default options nowadays is great. And if you're in Ukraine, Signal is not a bad option for you. Um, and if you're really looking to go to, I, I guess, really protect yourself, check out Briar. It's probably one of the safest recommendations we can push anyone to. And um, Nathan has some lessons. I just, I, I, I felt compelled to say this when I was thinking about it earlier. I want to acknowledge um, how fortunate we are. I, I think a lot of us watching this, not everyone, because I, I know we have viewers from all over the world, but I think a lot of us watching this will probably never be in a situation like this. Like, uh, you know, as we're recording this, I'm in a nice air conditioned apartment that is at virtually zero risk of being shelled or, you know, militants kicking down my door and I will probably never be in that situation and I'm very grateful for that but I do think that a lot of us may face lesser situations like civil unrest like I, I live in an area where in in the same week I saw pro George Floyd protests and pro Trump protests in my town and some of those you know do turn violent unfortunately and so yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I don't want to minimize what's going on over there, and I realize how, how fortunate I am, but I do still, still think there are lessons that we can learn. And uh, the main lesson I think we can learn is to prepare for disaster now. Like, I know we kind of talk about that a lot, but 
you know, we we can still look at what's going on over there and notice things like, what if the network goes down? You know, what if uh, cell towers get destroyed and those can't be used? Like like Henry said, Briar is an option there. And there's also like we've covered in the past, you know, there's things about like having cash on hand if, if you have enough expendable income to do that. Because we've covered many times, the, even with Ukraine in the past, they've had cyber attacks that disable ATMs and disable point of sales. Like, you know, DDoSing bank, bank websites, like it's kind of hard to transfer money or process payments when your bank is under attack. So Total. Um, just little things like that. And I'm gonna chime in right there, just to go from the other perspective. As of right now, when we're recording this, which is like 1, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on a Saturday, there's talks about Swift shutting down Russia's entire mm -hmm. banking system. I've been hearing about that a lot too. So even if you're in Russia and you're not actually being attacked, um, these sanctions and like Swift being shut down is going to directly impact all Russian citizens, even the ones opposed to the war. So th Swift, um, for for those who don't know, uh, from what I've heard, it's uh, it's basically Europe's entire uh, banking network. So if Russia gets shut off Swift they're pretty much unable to do any financial transactions in all of Europe. Yeah, it's pretty intense. And yeah, it really is. But yeah, and then just like the last few obvious pieces of advice we wanted to pass on, uh, keep your devices updated, use strong passwords, avoid phishing. This is primarily to uh, protect your devices from being taken over by like botnets and things like that. Because, you know, uh, again, both sides are using cyber warfare to their advantage. And if you don't keep your stuff protected, you might get your device infected and it might be for a side you don't necessarily agree with. So yeah, just um, try to prepare, try to think ahead, try to think of what could go wrong. And uh, again, you know, that's not me like blaming any of the, the people who are involved in this. We have the, the luxury of looking at what's going on and seeing what sh we could have done different. So let's apply it to our own lives and go, okay, what am I likely to face and how can I protect myself from that? Yeah, it was very well stated. and. I think the only thing I'll add, I don't want to add too much because, and like, please be aware, this is probably a long highlight story, but it's also a pretty massive one. This might be like one of the oh, largest yeah. stories of the year. So like, understand oh, This might that. be one of the largest stories of the decade. Honestly. So like, be aware of that. I know some of you complain when it gets a little ranty, but like, it's a pretty important topic. Um, and the last thing I'll end it with is, this is why privacy matters. It's only when people are affected by privacy that they realize the importance of it. And so now um, there was actually something going around that like they didn't want to show the, the Russian or the Ukraine's military movements. And they were asking people not to share this on social media. They were also um, encouraging lots of the Ukrainian citizens to get on end-to-end -end encrypted messaging and doing all these things that were just like, oh, this is just what we do day to day. And it really highlights the importance of privacy. People don't care about privacy and they say they have nothing to hide until something impacts them. And I think it's... At this day, in this day and age, it's almost becoming selfish and very self-centered to even say, oh, I don't care about privacy because I have nothing to hide. Because at a certain point, yeah, you might not have anything to hide, but you not taking privacy seriously still impacts the people around you. And I don't know, I, I, I didn't really think through exactly how I wanted to state that, but I just really wanted to highlight how badly people saying they don't care about privacy tends to age. Um, and this is a perfect <laughs> example of that. Like, things can only age poorly when you say you don't care about privacy. I wish I put yep. that more elegantly. No, I, I get what you mean, though. Um, not to get off topic, but yeah, we covered a story uh, earlier this year in the fall of Afghanistan where all of a sudden all the Afghans were, like, trying to erase their social media footprint and their, their web histories. And, you know, as I tell people all the time when they're like, well, I got nothing to hide. And it's like, I don't either, but I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, man. Like, maybe something that I post today is a big deal tomorrow, you know? And it's it's too late like just to kind of add on to what you're saying like it's too late once it's happened like once your social security number and your date of birth and your home address have been caught up in a data breach it's too late to freeze your credit and like keep your home <laughs> off public record and like it's so much easier to just not put it there in the first place like it's almost like dieting it is so much easier to not eat the slice of cake than to try and run off all those calories later. All right, well, we hope that was useful. I'm sorry if it was a little ranty. It was a little all over the place, but it's kind of a complicated thing. That's literally, if I open up my browser, I can probably get some new story about this that we can talk about. So it's very messy and it's kind of hard for us to consolidate it cleanly. So thanks for Dude, BBC News, the last like six episodes have just been Ukraine and nothing else. I think today was the first time they finally started having other stories back in. <laughs> okay, okay, final note, I promise.
<laughs> make sure you're keeping up with smaller news this week because if there's anything that people are trying to do that's a little shady, mm. this is the perfect opportunity to do it. So we just yep. suggest anyone to keep an eye on uh, some of the smaller news stories as well because this is probably the time where you're going to follow your local like news. That. Yep. We're going to migrate to data breaches. 464 Australian data breaches were reported to the OAIC in the latter half of 2021. Quote, the private health services industry is once again the sector with the highest number of reported data breaches in Australia, accounting for 18% of all breaches notified to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, or the OAIC, during that latter half of 2021, which is already a little alarming because this is private health data that is the most breached industry in Australia. So the finance filed the second most with 56, while legal accounting and management services rounded out the top three with 51. This was a 6% increase from 2021, uh, the first half of 2021. So there's a lot of other stats that I suggest you go into the description if you want to go read into them. Um, but pretty much this is the main thing we wanted to share with you. There was lots of di different data breaches and this really analyzes all the different data breaches suffered in Australia. So if you're Australian and you want to look into that, uh, very much suggested it goes into things caused by human error, things caused by system faults, and lots of other statistics that'll probably make sense if you read them than if we just throw out numbers in the podcast. Our next story comes from Credit Suite. And uh, if I pronounce that wrong, blame the BBC, because that's where I first heard this story, and that's how they pronounced it. Credit Suisse denies wrongdoing after a big banking data leak. So this is kind of a different story than usual. Um, this was a whistleblower, and it may have been an individual or it may have been an organization, we're not sure. They released the information on more than 18,000 bank accounts, totaling more than $100 billion, and that's a uh, 73.6 billion, I believe that's the pounds symbol. And this was leaked to the German newspaper that I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I will definitely screw that one up. And this included personal, shared, and corporate accounts dating as far back as the 1940s. The information revealed that many accounts are being used for drug trafficking and money laundering. So basically what they're claiming is that Credit Suisse has been knowingly opening accounts for known criminals and that it's been used for drug trafficking and money laundering and they're just okay with it. They're just letting it happen. So again, this one's a little bit different than our usual data breach, but I, I felt like it was still worth sharing anyways because it shows, again, the potential of rogue employees. Obviously, we're not ever telling you guys to do anything illegal, but it just shows how quickly your data can be caught up in something and exposed. So just be mindful of that kind of stuff. Up next, the cookware giant Mayer, Meyer has disclosed a cyber attack that impacted its employees. This took place on October 25th, 2021, which is getting close to six months ago. So remember, you don't learn about these data breaches sometimes for months after the fact, and we'll talk about that soon. And it affected thousands of employees. This included full names, addresses, date of births, gender, ethnicity, social security numbers, health insurance information, including medical conditions, drug screening results, COVID vaccination cards, driver's licenses, passports, government ID numbers, permanent residence cards, immigration statuses, and information on dependents. I, I don't know if I can think of anything else that could be caught in this data breach. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's like everything. Maybe salary information. <laughs> That's about it. Um, bathroom patterns. <laughs> so oh God. As, as a response to everything they leaked, they are offering their employees two years of credit monitoring and identity theft protection. This kind of does highlight kind of the really big concern. Two things. We're seeing a big rise in employer-related data breaches lately. Um, I think it was last week. No, not last week, but I think two or three weeks ago, we just had like half the data breaches were employee-related. Um, so it's pretty common nowadays. And also, again, it took months for them to find out about it. That's just something you have to keep in mind, right? Like prevention is the best approach and you should just assume that whatever you give your information to will be breached. So trying to mitigate what information you constantly share is always a good approach and also freeze your credit. All right, and our last story, um, this one, <laughs> Uh, personal opinion I is super messed up. Uh, DNA data of sexual assault victims exposed in breach at U.S. laboratory. I'm going to quote the article. The personal data of an unknown number of victims of sexual assault has been exposed following a breach at Oklahoma-based DNA Solutions, who, of course, uh, unquote the article, who, of course, blamed the breach on an unnamed third-party software. This included medical information, but did not include social security numbers, driver's license numbers, or financial information. And they are, of course, offering credit monitoring and identity theft protection to those affected. Yeah, no, like this is unfortunately a really sad story. You know, these these people are already going through something awful and they take the step to go forward and try to hold somebody accountable and now their data's out there. One concern that privacy people cite with biometric uh, authentication, like a fingerprint to unlock your phone, is what if that ever leaks? You can change a password. 
you can't change your fingerprint. It's something to be concerned about. Like at this point in time, I don't know how you would like reverse hash a fingerprint, but I, I'm sure that technology is on the way. So I, I don't think it's unrealistic at all to be concerned about that. And you know, now these people, again, their DNA is possibly out there and you definitely cannot change that. So that's just a very unsettling story on multiple fronts. Up next, we're gonna move over <laughs> to companies. Um, this one, I know many of you are going to love but we're gonna try to keep it pretty neutral here. Half of them are gonna hate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You all just are tough to predict sometimes. So a surveillance firm has says that Apple is quote, phenomenal for law enforcement. So PenLink is a Nebraska tech company that helps the US government track suspects, but also they sell data to local law enforcement. According to a leaked presentation, Google, Facebook, and Snapchat are worse. They could, they, cause they can provide location data to within three feet 60 to 90 feet and 15 feet um, respectively. So Google within three feet, which is just crazy. It's literally like in the same room. Um, 60 to 90 feet is Facebook and 15 feet for Snapchat. This is nothing new. We talk about this constantly. Apple's biggest drawback, if you're in the Apple ecosystem is iCloud backups. iCloud backups allows anyone to make a copy of whatever's on your phone. So even if you're using iMessage, which is end-to-end -end encrypted, if you do an Apple backup of your phone to iCloud, Apple has the decryption keys for your backups, which means they can now access your messages. This also carries over if someone else has it. So if you're communicating with someone else who is using iMessage, you both have end-to-end -end encryption, but if the other person does an iCloud backup, it's now possible for someone to theoretically access the messages that you're involved in. So this is Apple's biggest drawback. It's iCloud backups. The cool thing is it's very easy to avoid iCloud backups. You just go into your settings, turn it off, and you plug in your iPhone instead to a computer on iTunes, or if you just have a MacBook, you just use the Finder and you click backup locally and you encrypt the backup. That solves like 80% of the complaints with Apple. So to kind of summarize this whole story, Apple did do better than these other companies, but not by much, and there's still a major privacy issue. Two Apple users watching this, use encrypted local backups instead of iCloud backups to avoid this number one concern with the Apple ecosystem. Also, I want to kind of highlight and uh, point you all to the fact that um, we are currently working on an Apple privacy video that like deep dives into Apple privacy and where it excels and where it falls. Spoiler alert, iCloud backups are kind of the massive place it falls behind, but also there's some pros and cons to the whole ecosystem that we wanna cover and really dive into. So uh, stay subscribed to catch that. Up next, so there's a jaw-dropping Coinbase security bug that allowed users to steal unlimited cryptocurrency. And it is jaw-dropping indeed. When I read this, my jaw whew, all the way down to my desk. So basically a user could submit a transfer order, but edit the API request to make the source a different wallet. Coinbase would verify that the wallet had the funds, but not that the account was authorized to make the trade. So yeah, not good. Coinbase fixed this within six hours of when it was announced. And the moral here is use cold wallets or just anything. Yeah, nothing that's on an exchange. You don't store your crypto in exchanges. And our last business story, company story, Chinese firms caught using spyware to track employee job hunting and identify staff who may be about to resign. Sangfor is a Shenzhen based tech firm who has created a powerful software that monitors employees job seeking activities. It keeps track of resumes submitted and job search sites a person visits, then gives a score to the manager of a person's likelihood to resign. The article outlines how this is unfortunately the norm in China. This is actually really common and people just kind of accept it. Workplace surveillance software is uh, masquerading as security software and is very common in China as it is growing here in the US. Yeah, just be aware of that and, uh, you know, use VPNs, use, uh, make sure your devices are clean, use a separate device for work. This is the world we're moving into. On that note, we will move into research and we have some really good stories this week. Our first one is going to be how Samsung shattered encryption on 100 million phones. So this one, uh, admittedly, this is one of those stories that kind of went over my head a little bit, so I apologize if I get this wrong. As always, you should read the articles if you want to know more. From what I understand, researchers found a weakness in Trust Zone, which is the technology on ARM-based Androids, which is basically every Android, that allows for security-sensitive functions. So once you boot up the phone, this is the technology that basically says, like, hey, the phone's secure, we can start decrypting things and all that kind of stuff. Apparently, a lot of this had to do with the fact that Trust Zone was reusing keys. Experts were calling this super easy to exploit. Again, a lot of this went over my head, so unfortunately I can't really give you more detail because I don't want to uh, be wrong about it. But yeah, multiple experts were very harsh on Samsung. They were like, this is insultingly easy. Like, you, you should not have made this mistake. 
This is unacceptable. But uh, yeah, Samsung uh, needs to do better. Do better, guys. All right, so this next story, I'm gonna read the headline first. So a study shows that online privacy has become a cause of inequality. Now, I know some of you are like, ah, inequality, um, right off the bat, but this actually does go through some very important things we need to keep in mind, especially since we're trying to spread privacy to as many people as possible. Before we even get into this, I just want to mention that privacy is kind of a privilege nowadays. Like, a lot of people have to pay to have privacy. You have to be educated to know about privacy. And obviously, that's naturally going to lead to some inequality. That's what this study looks to do. Um, this is at least Nathan's favorite story this week because now he gets to be all justifiably snobby to everyone who uses Amazon and Facebook unapologetic, uh, unapol unapologetically. <laughs> I mean, I'm already snobby about it, but now I get to like back it up with research. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of the research, this was a global study and the number of participants was relatively low at around 800, but it did cover a variety of different countries and did account for factors like GDPR and CCPA. So I'll let Nathan take the research. Yeah, so uh, the research came from University of Canberra in Australia, which I probably mispronounced that, I'm sorry. I know Melbourne, that's the only one I got, guys, I'm sorry. And they, uh, quote, carried out a study investigating the factors that are defining this global digital privacy divide, unquote. They didn't really go into like details about uh, what they thought contributed to this inequality or um, anything like that. I mean, I'm sure the paper does, but this this article that kind of summarized the paper didn't really go into detail, but they did share a couple of interesting th uh, statistics. They found that young users, ages 15 to 32, were more concerned about digital privacy as opposed to older users who are, you know, over 33. In addition, the study showed that the ethnic background, occupation, and higher education levels of users had very minimal impact on digital privacy, uh, the digital privacy divide perceived by users. Uh, so I think what they meant by that is like, for example, if you live in Europe, uh, because of things like the GDPR, your ethnicity and your job and things like that really don't factor into your privacy because you're guaranteed a certain level of protection under the GDPR. Whereas, you know, if, if I were to move to Nigeria, for example, likewise, my race and age and things like that would not factor in because to my knowledge, Nigeria does not have any kind of privacy law. So I, I think that's really what they were focusing on was privacy on more of a national scale. And again, we mentioned like GDPR and CCPA, and it's it's just a very regional thing where uh, wealthier regions, you know, Japan and China have also have really good privacy laws. I mean, China's, yes, is definitely designed to benefit the Communist Party, but that notwithstanding, it's a really solid privacy law. You know, all these, these uh, really wealthier areas are starting to get better privacy and uh, areas that are less affluent are unfortunately not getting that same benefit. So I, I think that's kind of what they were looking into if I understood this right. Yeah, and like, that's the national scale. And I think this study is really important. And it also should make you think about your privacy journey yourself. Like how much time did, did you as a listener to this podcast take to finally start migrating away from the Google ecosystem? Are you still in the Google ecosystem? Think of all the time that it took and the energy and the education and for many of you, the money. Like, yeah. do you pay for your email provider nowadays? You probably do, unless you're just relying on like free plans for everything. So like you really have to consider these things and how not everyone is going to take all that time, energy and is going to be in a fortunate enough place to um, deal with privacy. And I think that's something we should always keep in mind and we should try to make privacy as accessible as we possibly can for people, whatever that means to you. I think that is a really important thing, you know, it's just that kind of empathy of like, you know, like I, I set up a, my own Nextcloud server and that took months of trial and error. Like, I don't know if I've said this enough times, I am not a tech expert. Like, sure, I'm, I know more than the average person, but I'm not like a programmer or anything. And that took months of trial and error. And that relies on me, number one, having high speed internet that has enough bandwidth for me to self host. Number two, having a device lying around that I can self host. Uh, number three, having the time, you know, like how are you gonna expect like a single mother or father with like three kids to find the time to learn how to set up a Nextcloud server? Like, yeah, it, it privacy really is a privilege, unfortunately. And I know I've mentioned that in the past and it's, it's unfortunate that it's that way, but that's kind of how it is at the moment. Totally agreed. We're gonna move on to the next story, which is a, a big yikes. Microsoft confirms Windows wiping tool leaves user data on disk. There's actually a setting where uh, if you're getting ready to like 
give away your computer or sell it or whatever, you can go and just hit a button and it'll factory reset your computer. And it's supposed to wipe all your user data. This person, Rudy Ooms, discovered that that is not the case, at least on certain versions of Windows. It affects uh, Windows 10 and 11 versions 21 H2. So two things happen. First of all, BitLocker goes away. If, uh, if you use BitLocker, it gets removed because obviously you're resetting the computer, you're removing that encryption. And then once you reboot it and you log into the device, if you look through the file systems, you'll find a folder called windows.old or windows old, something like that. And that's all your user data in plain text. There's a couple ways around this. First of all, Microsoft has been made aware of this. Uh, they say that they're trying to push out a fix. Until then, you could use a third party device. For example, you could take the hard drive out, put it on a USB cable and then wipe it that way. Or you could just go ahead and do the install and then log in and delete the Windows old folder. Yeah, either way, I guess the, the real lesson here is to always double check and make sure that things are in fact wiped and are working the way they are supposed to be. And then our last research story, AirTag clone bypassed Apple's tracking protection features claims researcher. So a security researcher claims he bypassed the tracking protection features built into Apple's Find My App and AirTag tracking devices with a custom made AirTag clone. Basically he reverse engineered an Air AirTag, made his own and found some ways to bypass the features. The first one was he basically continuously broadcasted a new, never before seen public key. So that way uh, devices that were scanning for any air tags that haven't been around their owner in 72 hours or whatever, they kept seeing a new key so they didn't realize it was the same device. The second bypass was just to not build in a speaker. I think this is kind of more of just a like, because you can kind of research to be totally honest, not to like downplay the research this person did. Malicious actors already know how to cut the speaker. Like there's somebody on Etsy that's selling Air, air tags like that, Etsy or eBay, whatever. Someone somewhere is selling them like that. But I mean, yeah, I, I guess it is interesting to know that that option does exist for those with more advanced threat models. So interesting research at, at very least. Now we're gonna migrate into politics. Now we're gonna start with, the, with New York who has announced a statewide cybersecurity coordination center. So this is located in Brooklyn and it will quote, serve as a centralized location for state officials to turn in times of cyber crisis. The officials said the Joint Security Operations Center will be com comprised of experts from federal and state law enforcement entities, representatives from local and county governments, and NYC3, which is a body coordinating New York City cyber defenses across more than 100 agencies and offices. The mayor said the command center will strengthen the state's threat detection capability by, quote, centralizing telemetry data, allowing officials to assess and monitor potential threats in real time. The center will also help officials streamline threat intelligence and responses in the event of a significant cyber attack. Interesting news if you're in New York. I was excited about it until I read that telemetry part. And yeah. then I was like, oh, come on, man. Yeah. It's just yeah. another surveillance center. Yep. <laughs> Anyways. So we have an update on an older story. Missouri's governor's office is responsible for a teacher data leak. So a few months ago, I think it was at this point, there was a story about a reporter who was doing some research and he was on the official website, some official state website. And for whatever reason, he used the view source code option, which on most browsers is F12 and was just looking at the source code, which for the record, I've done that too. Like if I look at somebody else's website and I'm like, oh, they did this really cool thing. I wonder how they did that. I'll look at the source code and see what they did. Well, lo and behold, when he looked at the source code, he found the social security numbers of teachers embedded in the co code, which just blows my mind. I don't understand any reason that you would possibly do that. But anyways, he was responsible. He reported it to the governor's office. And then the governor, who clearly does not understand how to turn on his phone, said that this was hacking and he's going to sue him. So the update is that they have dropped the lawsuit. I'm going to assume because they couldn't find a lawyer stupid enough to take the case because there's no way he was gonna win this lawsuit. Furthermore, an investigation has revealed that the exposure dates back to 2011. In 2009, the state centralized all their IT systems in-house, which means that for the last however many years this has been exposed, this has been the government's fault and the governor was supposed to have this secured. So I think that's another reason they dropped the lawsuit because they realized like, not only are we not gonna win this because no one will take it, but also like, we're definitely in the wrong here and now we're open to lawsuit. So fortunately, the, the guy did not get sued for doing the right thing. But I think the story is again, we've mentioned this a couple times, it's a good reminder that sometimes you don't know how long vulnerabilities are out there and uh, you don't know who will find them. We don't know if anyone else has found this before and just not reported it and kept the data for malicious purposes. So. Yeah, always beware, be proactive. 
Our next story is about SWIFT, which we talked about earlier. CIA is data mining SWIFT financial data from Europe. I'm going to quote the article. About 11,000 banks from 200 countries process their payments through the SWIFT system, which currently processes about 40 million records a day. So that just kind of gives you a background of what SWIFT is, like we talked about earlier. Basically, this article investigates how the CIA receives certain SWIFT transactions as part of their counterterrorism efforts. As usual, though, the concern here is that what fits their scope and uh, what data they request is allegedly very, very broad. And I find that easy to believe. It can include anyone from the same financial institution as a known, known Islamic State member, so, you know, if an IS member happened to be using my bank, I could get caught up in that. Oh, I'm not in Europe, but hy hypothetically. All transactions over a certain period, just all transactions for this specific day, or transactions from a specific area. So again, all transactions from this town, which is, again, just overwhelmingly broad. If you live in Europe, like, I, I guess cash, man, if, if that's an option. I don't know how, like, anti-cash Europe is, but... Yeah, just try not to create any financial data in the first place. Like, please don't store your, your money under your mattress, but at the same time, maybe don't use your debit card for everything. So, yeah. Yeah, and also, I guess this also, for me, this also outlines threat modeling. Like, there's there's nothing you can do about this. Like, from from a technical standpoint, right? Unless you're, you're going to illegal territories. You shouldn't have expected privacy from the SWIFT system in the first place. And it's because of stories like this. But also be aware that your financial your finances themselves are probably safe, right? At least safe enough to still have confidence that your money will be there for the next several years. Yeah, they're not stealing bank money from bank accounts. <laughs> exactly. So this is more of like people who have like much higher threat models who are trying to avoid having their, their finances caught up from um, terrorist investigations with the claim of stopping terrorism, like the one we're just talking about. So again, threat modeling is also important here is what I would argue, because I think for most people, this is concerning and we want to take care of it and we wish it wasn't happening, but it's probably not something you need to like personally act on unless it's something that affects you negatively for your threat model. Then like Nathan said, um, sticking with cash using prepaid debit cards. I think there's via buy in the EU, which is like a prepaid debit card option. Um, I don't know. I think Revolut as well. Yeah. I could be wrong about that one. Yeah. There's a couple options. There's also, I mean, we, we also encourage Monero when you can, there's things like coin cards. I don't know if coin cards works in the EU, but just other things to consider. Up next, data protection has become a fundamental right in Brazil. So the Brazilian Congress has enacted an amendment to the constitution that makes personal data protection a fundamental citizen right. The changes make personal data protection an unchangeable clause, meaning any changes to this theme will have to be aimed at expanding and protecting citizen rights, which is very exciting. I mean, I can't even like imagine what this is like in the US. Can you imagine the next amendment of the United States is like no. guaranteed <laughs> data protection? Wouldn't that be sick? Um, I think the closest I could see to that is if they expanded the Fourth Amendment to include digital property. Probably, yeah. That's that's the closest I could imagine. I agree. I don't think it's actually going to be in the Constitution. <laughs> At least, I wish. If, if it ever did, it's probably not going to happen for the next several decades. But yeah, um, it is something. It's an exciting thought that it could it could possibly happen. And so I can dream. You can dream. With that, we will move into free and open source news. And our first story is going to come from Simple Login, who is now handling their support through Zendesk. For those who don't know, Simple Login is an email forwarding solution. We've mentioned them quite a few times on here. They're really fantastic and we totally recommend them. Uh, Simple Login basically allows you to um, create forwarding email addresses that all forward to your regular inbox. So that way you can, for example, sign up for a newsletter and once they start spamming you with newsletters twice a day, you can delete the email address and you, you know, don't have to get spam from them anymore. Or if a company is not unsubscribing you like they're supposed to, or if your email gets caught up in a data breach and you start getting spam, like it's just, it's incredibly useful. This sounds pretty good. So simple login is growing, which is good. And um, they've decided they need a new customer support solution. Like they can't really just handle direct emails anymore. It's getting too, too unruly. So, uh, quoting the article, after studying existing options, that was their quote, they decided on Zendesk. They decided on Zendesk because it is GDPR compliant and like CCPA compliant, compliant with a whole bunch of different privacy laws. They ensured, like they talked to Zendesk and they ensured that Zendesk only records information you submit on the ticket. So they should not be recording your IP address or your browser or any of that stuff. I actually went ahead and tested this. I, I went ahead and went to open a ticket. I didn't actually open a ticket, but I went to open a ticket on Simple Login and see what it looks like. And there are exactly three, three fields. 
There is what happened, which is a long entry box. So it's a big paragraph where you can type out what your problem is. There is an attachment section, which is of course optional if you want to include any screenshots or anything like that. And there is a where can we reach you email address, which by default was my my actual email address I gave Simple Login. But what they did is they have a little button right next to that where you can create a new Simple Login email address on the fly while submitting this ticket. So you don't even have to go back and make one. You just hit, hit the button and it makes one for you. So now when you send that to Zendesk, they don't see your real email address. They see that simple login email. They did say you can still email them, but they can't really guarantee response times because this is their new system. So I, I guess that's the good news. If you're having trouble with like email forwarding, you can still get a hold of uh, simple login directly. It just might take longer, but yeah. So um, sounds like they did, did their due diligence and this seems hopefully like a really good system and congratulations on them to them for growing. And our final FOSS story of the news comes from Lockdown. Lockdown is a uh, app for iOS where essentially you it connects via your VPN slot on the phone and it tries its best to block any trackers from other apps. So if your apps have Google Analytics running on them, that's the kind of thing that Lockdown will try to block for you. It's kind of nifty. They recently passed an audit and they found that no logs are on the VPN. There is a VPN feature as well if you want more than just the tracker protection. Um, there is no access to user data, they have good security practices, and more. So again, this isn't perfect assurance, this is 100% trusted, but it is a great step forward um, in order to reaffirm people that it's a trusted service. If you've never tried Lockdown, give it a shot, and a pro tip, on iOS, you can have your own VPN, like iVPN, and Lockdown running at the same time if you use IKEV2, which is not something you can do on Android, so that's a little iOS perk. With that, we're going to move into Misfits, which is our final section, and we only have one story for you guys this week, and it's a real quick one. It's actually two stories that I, I figured I'd roll into one since they kind of have the same moral. The first one says the Xenomorph malware has burrowed into Google Play users. No face hugger required. Uh, it's basically just talking about the spread of this malware on Google Play. Similarly, the other story says almost 100,000 new mobile banking Trojan strains detected in 2021. So this is just our periodic reminder to you guys. Apps can be dangerous if they are malicious. Uh, they have incredible amount of permissions. They can siphon a lot of data. So if you have to download an app on your phone, first of all, ask if you really need it. If you do, vet it carefully, make sure it's trusted, make sure you're getting it from the correct source. And um, yeah, just delete any apps you don't need because every single app you download is another potential attack vector. All right, and that was all of our stories this week. So, of course, we weighed in on the Ukraine thing, which if we hear any more, again, we're, we're sticking to the privacy and security stuff here, but if we hear any more relevant stories out of that, we will definitely let you guys know. We, we had the story about Apple and just some more reaffirm or reaffirmation, affirmation, whatever word I'm looking for, just more confirmation that, uh, you know, Apple is a slightly better choice in terms of privacy, but they're certainly not bulletproof. Yeah, we had some a lot of really interesting research this week, I think, and, uh, you know, fortunately, it was kind of a slightly quieter week in terms of number of stories. We want to remind you again, a great way to support Surveillance Report and keep us going is cryptocurrency. TechLore accepts Bitcoin and Monero. The New Oil accepts Bitcoin, Monero, Ethereum, Litecoin, and a couple others I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Keep us going so you can keep, we can keep bringing you guys news like this. We want to thank you so much for listening to Surveillance Report. We are happy to know that you guys are trying to stay safe out there in this ever-evolving digital landscape. The final thing we want to ask of you is to share the podcast around. Share it with, you know, anyone, friends, family, especially like what I like to do is if I hear a story that's relevant to somebody, be like, hey, check this out and I'll give them the timestamp. So, you know, that's a really good way to get people listening. Make sure you are subscribed so you catch new episodes. Give us a rating if you're on a platform where that is an option. We want to reach as many people as possible with the message of privacy and you can help us do that. Thank you again for listening and we will see you next week.